Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue our study in the book of the prophet Amos, uh, getting towards a conclusion. Maybe even there, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, See, maybe uh, not. Maybe it'll all come to an end. Who That's knows? right. So we're just glad that you that we, we can get together in God's Word. You know, uh, I'm not quite sure because the Word was written 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. It says, we're two or more gather in my name. There I am in your midst. Yeah. So I like, I'm not quite sure what the midst of us is right now. With people around the world watching this, our midst may be pretty big. Yeah. So before we start, and we'll be starting in Amos chapter 8, verse at verse 1. If you want to turn your Bible there. And it's always a good idea, like I've said, to have pen and paper, pencil and paper, so you can jot down notes or questions. And if you have questions or suggestions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. It's as simple as that. We've made it very easy. Amen. So before we start, I'm going to ask Brother Mark, Mark, if you would ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for being with us today, and we thank you for the word. Just yes. guide us where you want to go in it and what you want to bring out in the midst of us and to to better be your ser your bond servants. Amen. 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 And Father, as always, I pray, don't let anything come out of my mouth that you didn't put in my heart. All right, Amos chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. And the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. That is something that's not very uncommon in the Bible, and in, especially in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. A play on words, right? The Hebrew word for a basket of summer fruit, for summer fruit, is kaitz. And the Hebrew word for the end, the end has come, is kaitz. Can you spell it? It's in Hebrew, my dear. Oh, oh, it's the Hebrew. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, how do you uh, phonetically sound it? <laughs> Make an appointment and see me later. <laughs> okay, kaitz. Okay, but they, the words sound very similar, and they, that's because they have a, a similar foundation. You see, the summer fruit was the last fruit harvested at the year, so it was the end, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew word for, for the summer fruit and the end are very, very similar. So mm -hmm. God uses this as a play on words. He gives Amos a picture of a basket of summer fruit and says, what do you see? And Amos says, I see, I, I see a basket of summer food. Right. And I says, you're right. The end yes. has come. Yeah. All right. And, and he says, I'll spare them no longer. Yeah. This is his people he's speaking of, right? Well, I want to, let me do, do this first of all. When is the end? Now, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. And I'm in good company. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said, but of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Mark 13, 32. Mm -hmm. It did not, it did not end on September 23rd of no, 2017. Mm -hmm. That's what David Mead said recently, all right? Although I have to tell you, it would have been quite a great 50th anniversary present had, right? if he had come back. That, that was our anniversary. Yeah. We were married 20, 50 30. years on September 23rd. That would have been great. Go from a cruise to a trip. Hallelujah. Let's <laughs> go, man. And just a couple of points. The rapture did not happen in 1988, right. as Edgar Wizent predicted in his very, very successful book, 88 Reasons, why the rapture will be in 1988. And I tell you, the church promoted that thing like crazy. And Christians were selling their houses, quitting their jobs. Do they not know the word of God? Well, apparently they don't, okay? It didn't, the world didn't end 
and Jesus didn't return, as Charles Taze Russell said in late 1800s, I think in the 1870s, he was the founder of the, uh, he became the father of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then again, he prophesied that it would happen, I think, in 1914. And when Jesus didn't show up, they said, well, yeah, he did. It was just invisible. Okay. And over the centuries, since the ascension of Jesus Christ, there have been so many people who have set a date and prophesied and said, here's the date for the end. Don't you get it? Don't you get it? Jesus said, even he doesn't know. No man knows. Only the Father. What you need to know is you need to be ready. Because what? It could be right now. It's going to come like a thief in the night. Yes. Yeah. A pattern emerges here. After the failing of their predictions, the ones I just mentioned and all the more, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes clear that the message of these false prophets or even brothers in error do not encourage people to look for Jesus' coming, but to mock his coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this one that just took place. Right. I mean, it became, it, it makes Christianity look like a laughing stock. Right. You know, this yeah, guy gets his notice. Yeah. Here we go again. Yeah, they're predicting the end of the world. Right. And, you know, they're giving you a date and, and it doesn't happen. It's oh. like crying wolf. Yes. If you know your fables, yes. Right. So I don't know when the end is going to come. I don't know. But I'll tell you what I do know. Know this, first of all. That in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises. Some count slowness but is patient towards you. Hmm. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. There is an end, yes. and God knows the time. The only reason it hasn't happened, this is what the word of God is saying. This is what the spirit of God moved Peter to say is because God is patient. He's not, the end is not going to come till everybody's heard the gospel. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. And we may be very close to that yes. given the technology and the missionary work. Yes. But it's going to come like a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. Don't think that it couldn't happen right now. The things that, you know, for years, and this is one of the things that's always troubled me. I mean, like I said, for centuries, people were prophesying Jesus is coming back. But there are prophecies that had to be fulfilled. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And they had not been fulfilled, mm -hmm. such as the restoration of the nation of Israel. But the prophecies, I'll tell you what, go check them out. And they have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. It is possible for it to happen now. Right. And whether it happens or not, you want to know something? Life is fragile. Whether Jesus comes, there's a, just a, there's a stronger possibility that you'll go. Mm -hmm. We don't have any guarantee of life on this planet. Yeah, this is, this so you need to be ready situation. in season and out of season. Like Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about, he's talking about preaching. But we need to be ready to meet our Lord. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because that could happen any time. Now, you see, as, Am as Amos was prophesying, by the Spirit of the Lord, about the kingdom of Israel's end, it did come in 722 B.C. when it was conquered by the Assyrians. And the people, this is the people of God, the Israelites, were carried off into captivity. Right? They became the ten lost tribes. Right? Okay. Remember, after Solomon, 
the nation, the nation of Israel, which had been a, a unified nation, mm-hmm. with with the capital in Jerusalem, was divided between the north, ten tribes in the north, and then Judah, basically down in the south. Right. But the north was capt- ca- carried off into captivity. Now it's it's really worth pondering, meditating on this. All right. Okay. What other prophets were saying in that same time frame, Mm -hmm. in that same period of time, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I want to quote from two who were basically contemporaries, Hosea and Isaiah. The prophet Hosea said, and this is God speaking through them, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Hosea 4, 6. That's pretty serious stuff. And then Isaiah says in Isaiah 5, 13, Therefore, my people go into captivity for their lack of knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude is parched with thirst. So you get this? What's it boiled down to? Disobedience? Not knowing God's word? If you don't know God's word, I'm going to tell you something. You don't know God. That's right. You may have some vague impression. It's like, you know, you may you, you may look and turn on the, the telly and see your favorite movie star and say, I know it. You don't know him. You don't know him at all. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't know him at all. And if you don't know his word, the things that he's spoken, you don't know him. And what he wants us to know is in his word. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, he has revealed That's right. his plan. He has revealed his love for us. I'm, I'm, you have to know it. That's why, you know, Jesus said this, and we've talked about this so many times during this study. In John chapter 8, he said, if you abide in my word, dwell in my word, reside in my word, continue in my word, however you want to say it, you're truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yes. You've got to be abiding in the Word. I, I saw an article in the, uh, you know, Alice and I, we spent a lot of time over, a lot of time over in the UK and in Europe. Mm-hmm. And I was reading an article, I, I don't remember exactly where it was, this week. Mm-hmm. I think while we were at sea, I actually saw it in the news, about how in Britain, so few Anglicans... Have, don't have any knowledge of the scriptures whatsoever. Mm. Well, then you're not Christian. No. Because it's not like it's not like you're living in some land where the Bible doesn't exist or you're not allowed. I mean, my goodness, there's no excuse for you not to know the word. The only excuse is you don't want to know it. That's right. And that's what it is. You don't want to know it. People go into captivity. People perish for their lack of knowledge. Because they reject it. Because they reject it. Okay. So, I, like I said, I don't know exactly when the end is coming, but I know it's coming. Mm-hmm. And I also know that it's preceded by bad stuff. Yes. Wars and rumors of wars. Violence increasing. Lawlessness increasing. I mean, go read Matthew 24 and see the things that Jesus said. The earthquakes. Go, go read mm-hmm. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and see what Paul said to, to his son in the faith, Timothy, about these last days. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are not pleasant times, okay? So I, this is just a little aside, but it really makes me curious why in an age like ours, when people are such lovers of self, and boy they are, mm-hmm. just like Paul said to Timothy, in a time when every so many people are so focused on longevity, right? I'm living longer, on vitamins, on exercise, on health foods, on air quality, safety features, and all kinds of products. Investing for in retirement, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and on and on and on and on ad nauseum. Why don't they invest in the real retirement? They don't have. To. See, that's the point. They don't have to invest because the free gift of God is eternal life. So here they are struggling. The masses of people, including Christians, are struggling to stay on this planet a little bit longer. I guess they didn't know what Paul knew when he said to live as Christ and die is gain. And yet the free gift of God is eternal life, and they reject that. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense whatsoever. 
Well, the whole head is sick. That's what the Bible says. That's what it says, again, in Isaiah, yeah. in the first chapter of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. What was the question that you asked the one guy at the store? Oh, my goodness, Mark, that's a little vague. Well, I ask people questions all the time. Best buy. At the best buy. At the best buy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Mark is talking about uh, a number of years ago. Alice and I were up staying with friends and doing some ministry in upstate New York. And our dear brother, Bob, Bob Rizzoni, uh, was having some issues with his computers. And since I am more familiar with those computers, he asked if I would go to the store, to Best Buy with him, to, to try and find what he needed. So we went to, uh, to Ithaca, New York, and we walked into a Best Buy, and there was a guy, a greeter at the door. And as we walked into the door, the man said, uh, are there any questions I can answer for you? And I said, yeah. He said, okay. And I said, why is it when there is an all-loving God to whom nothing is impossible, and all he wants to do is bless people, why is it that so many people are rejecting him? And the guy just stood there with this blank look on his face, like he didn't know what to say. And so after a long, very pregnant pause, he said to me, uh, I, I meant about computers. <laughs> But you did plant the seed. Yes, which we try to do all the time, yes. as a matter of fact. So, because indeed, in spite of all of the worldly precautions mm -hmm. and all the worldly preparations, as in those eight days of old, Amos says, as I go on, to Amos 8, 3 to 7, the songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares mm -hmm. the Lord God. Many will be the corpses. In every place they will cast them forth in silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy to do away with the humble of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we can sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger and to cheat with dishonest scales so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals and that we may sell the refuge of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, indeed, I will never forget any of their deeds. Hmm. This is the people that he has formed for himself, a people he formed to declare his praise. Okay? Hmm. And now he is talking about bringing destruction upon his own people. And it's interesting, he said that he will never forget any of their deeds yeah. because he will forget if you repent and turn to him. Well, that's the key, is the repentance. Yeah. Because I'll go back to Isaiah. Remember, these are contemporaries, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah said, I, and this is God speaking through Isaiah, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, 25. Right. God, listen, when you have repented of a sin, when you have won, if you, if you, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. But we need to be quick to repent. Because if we go before him and are quick to repent, he is quick to, to forgive. forgive. Yes. All right? He is faithful, righteous in his judgment to forgive. And when God forgives your sin, it is cast away as, the far, as far as the east is from the west. And that's why you, if you're saved and you have, have repented of your sin, you can say like Paul did, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. It's gone. When somebody comes along and accuses you of something, and that's pretty common. Yes. The accuser of the brethren. Because Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. But here's what you have to do. If you get accused of something, you need, because it says, let a man examine himself. Mm -hmm. If you did that thing that you're being accused of, repent. Wash it. Get it out. God will forgive you. Yes. If you haven't done it, just blow it away. Never think about it again. Because remember, Satan is a liar by nature and the father of lies. I, I, you know, most of, I've been accused of a lot of things in the past 40 some odd years of ministry. I, mm -hmm. I promise you that. And with, with few exceptions, they've been lies. Well, they should be. Because they come from the accuser of the brethren, who is the father of lies. Mm -hmm. He's a liar by nature. And if I recognize that I didn't actually do that thing, you know what? I don't even need to defend myself. No. He is my so defense. He is the defense of my life. 
When you start to defend yourself, you get in trouble. All right? Just rejoice in your salvation. Okay? So you can have that joy of your salvation. It's about returning to the Lord. That's what repentance is. And the ministry of a prophet like, like Amos, mm-hmm. like Hosea, mm-hmm. like Isaiah, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing, is to call people to repentance. Yes. That was the first message of John the Baptist. Was it was the first the message of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Okay. But in Lamentations 2 verse 14, Solomon in his wisdom said this, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions. And they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. But they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. They're just telling you, hey. See, the goal of God has always been to restore from captivity. To bring to life. Remember, that was a whole thing we looked at, I don't know how many weeks ago now, in Amos chapter Mm 4. Over and over, God said, I brought this, I did this, I did this. And yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. We need prophets who will prophesy. I mean, and God can bring an encouraging word to a prophet. Hallelujah. But if there is error in your life, if there is a problem in your life, rejoice that God will send a prophet to bring that to light in your life. Think, Think about this. Most people, in this day and age, people love prophets. Prophets who run around and say, God wants you rich. God wants you to have, you're going to have, you're going to have money. You're going to have a new car. You're going to have a, they look. Those are the false and foolish visions, mm-hmm. right? They're, They're not doing times. what a prophet ought to do. No, no calling right. them to repent, right? That's what they need to be doing. But think about this. So I'm going to read from Numbers chapter 11. I'm reading verses 27, 8, and 9. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. God wants us all, because that's what Peter said. If any man speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. What verse was that? That was Numbers 11, verses 27 to 29. All right? Because, you know, we do this Bible study so you know more. I mean, we're talking about getting knowledge, right? But re- remember that Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, love builds up. The goal of our instruction is love, okay? The message is love, regardless of how it sounds. Yes. Because all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. And it does say in Greek, God-breathed. And that is important. Not inspired. Not be- the reason, because the breath of God is what gives life. That's right. Go well, back and check your Genesis. Right. So, but think about that. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11 says this. Right, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor think when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? 
So they disciplined us for a short time, it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God is bringing judgment on the earth. Yes. Now, you may not like this because most of the church doesn't like this. Look around in the news. Look at what's happened here in, in, uh, in America, the Caribbean, and Mexico, over in the Far East and uh, the Eastern Pacific. I mean, these things, you may not like this. These are the judgments of God. And his purpose is, like it says in Amos, is to get the attention of people so that they turn to him. What God wants is people to be able to say, like I can say, from whence cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord. To cry out to him, save me. Yes. You know what? The world can't save you. That should become obvious after what's going on. But God is there, ready and able. Nothing is impossible with God. He wants people to call out on him. You know, we've prayed for salvation for people and prayed, Lord, whatever it takes. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? We have to have that attitude. There is nothing more important than eternal life. Because if you don't have that attitude, you are never going to be able to die to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to deny yourself. You're always going to be chasing after fairy tales. You're always going to be chasing after fables. You're always going to be looking for prophets who will tell you the nice things and never correct you. Self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. It's time for the church to, I, I, is this a reasonable thing? Man up, that's what they say, man up. Man up. Well, yeah, we're supposed to be the army of the Lord. And we're supposed to be an army that is fit to fight the enemy in the ultimate battle. He's for given our, us the spirit of boldness. Because our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Right. So actually, I thought I might actually even finish Amos night. <laughs> oh, how silly I am. <laughs> Um, I, I want to. I'm going to wait till next week to get into verses eight through twelve in Amos eight, because there's so much meat in there, you know. And it says that the solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. Hebrews eleven. All right. Is it five fourteen? Hebrews five fourteen. That's where that is. Because we have to train ourselves to look for God in everything. You have to train your eyes to look for God's presence in everything that's going on. You have to train your ears to hear his voice because that's where faith comes from. And we need to grow in our faith to be pleasing and walk in. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are a God of love. And that you love us so very much, Father, that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, that we would have that eternal life, that gift of eternal life. Lord, help us to walk in faith, led by your Spirit. For you said that you lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, that's our desire. We want to hide in that hiding place that you have set in Psalm 119, Lord God, to keep us safe and secure from all alarm in these trying times. Well, God bless you and goodbye till next time. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies are the best.